The following PowerPoint presentation is taken from the Hebrew Root Seminar presented in Branson, Missouri in the fourth month of 2008. Some of you who watch this video are probably sensing that there is something more to the Savior of mankind than what is commonly taught in various churches. Maybe you sense a little bit of dissatisfaction with your current understanding and long for something more. And maybe you feel a yearning for moving beyond the basic elements of being saved by grace. If you are raised as a Gentile in an English-speaking American culture, it can often be too easy to look at and interpret the scriptures from a perspective of the society that we live in. It is very important that we begin to recognize that the Bible we hold in our hands and read from every day is not an American or European document. English-speaking Americans are not the authors. Most all of the authors were Jewish, and the Bible is actually a Middle Eastern document. It really does help if we keep this perspective in mind when we read it. And so I want everyone watching this video to try your best to think beyond the pattern we see in the modern church age. What the teachings of men like Billy Graham, Chuck Swindoll, Charles Stanley, Bill Gothard, and other popular Bible teachers of today. Let's go even further back than the old-time Christianity of Oswald Chambers and John Wesley and Martin Luther. In fact, let's think further back than the writings of the Gentile Church Fathers, which certainly has had a lot of influence over the thinking and practices of the modern church era. Let's go all the way back and try to think in terms of what the first century assembly was really like. It really is amazing how much impact a church history can have on our thinking. For instance, how many of you, when you think of Jesus, have something like this in mind? Now notice the circle above his head in the center picture. The reason the artist here depicted him with a circle above his head is to represent a halo. However, the halo is not found anywhere in Scripture. Rather, it is found in other religions which have nothing to do with the Bible. The circle represents the sun, which was often worshipped in ancient times. And sadly, the Messiah of Israel is pictured with this pagan symbol. Here is another painting. Now notice here he's seated in the Buddhist position, and there's a yin and yang in his hand. I don't think he'd be too pleased with these kinds of depictions. Now in each one of these paintings, he is depicted to have long hair which is kind of interesting because we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 14 it says there that does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair it is a dishonor to him and so why would they depict the savior of mankind the messiah of Israel as being long haired and so, what did our Savior actually look like? Now, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 50, verse 6, we have a prophecy about the Messiah. And it says, I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Now, in spite of this, in some circles, is actually a sign of your Christianity to keep your face clean-shaven. My step-grandfather, years ago, was a person that went through town. It was his job to read meters. And um, he would always go to this one particular lady's house who uh, would comment on his beard. Now, he had a large uh, black beard. And um, this lady would often comment on his beard. 
she would say something like, why don't you shave that beard off? Yeah, he just kind of took it and didn't say a whole lot. You know, he was working for the city. And then um, one month, because it was a monthly thing, he would go and read the meters. Uh, he went in the house there to read the meter, and um, and the lady had a painting of Jesus, much like one of the paintings we saw here in the video. And it was on the wall, and he stopped and said, well, who is this on the wall here? And she says, well, that's my Jesus. And uh, he says, well, he has a beard. And uh, needless to say, she did not say anything about his beard after that point. But it kind of goes to show, sometimes even our own traditions are contradictory. Now, Scripture does say that the Messiah was not necessarily a good-looking man, unlike what might be seen in some of the paintings. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 2, it says, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. And so, he wasn't necessarily a beautiful-looking man. And I've often wondered if that might be one reason why they didn't really accept him. They were expecting somebody that looked more glorious. But what did he actually look like? Well, I would venture to say that since he was a Jew, living in the first century, there is a pretty good chance that he looked like a Jewish man that lived in the first century. Now, some scientists had taken a skull of a first century Jew and actually reconstructed what the, the person's face looked like. Now, this does not necessarily mean what the Messiah looked like here. But um, they look something like this, maybe. Well, maybe, maybe not. We don't know. Um, I would tend to think that um, maybe he didn't look quite like that. But um, who knows? Maybe he did look something like this. But we can be sure about one thing. He did not walk around with a halo above his head. And he would not want to associate himself with various pagan religions and various pagan symbols. And I think it's best if we try not to think of what he looked like, since we don't know what he looked like, and we don't want to have a false image in our minds. However, we do know he had a beard. And we can also be very sure that he wore certain kinds of garments, such as the tassels. What are tassels? Well, tassels are one thing that every observant Jew in the first century would have worn. In Numbers chapter 15, verse 38, it says, Speak to the children of Israel, tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations, and to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners, and you shall have the tassel that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments. And again in chapter 22 of the book of Deuteronomy, verse 12, it says, You shall make tassels on the four corners of the clothing with which you cover yourself. And so what was a tassel, or what is a tassel? Now, we have a photo here of what we think a tassel could have looked like. This is how it's commonly done today among some Jewish circles. And um, how many of you remember the story of the woman who suffered from an issue of blood? And she was healed by touching the hem or corner or fringe of his garment. Remember the story? Well, let's go back to that story. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 20 through 21. It says, And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for twelve years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, If, if only I may touch his garment, I should be made well. 
And now the word in the Greek language, which is translated him in this particular verse, this is the King James, is from uh, Strong's number 2899, Crespodon. And the, in the Barclay Greek dictionary, it says Crespodon, a fringe, edge, or tassel. And in the Strong's Concordance, it has a fringe or tassel. And the Freiburg Greek lexicon, it has as the outer limit of something a garment, hem, border, edge in Jewish usage, the tassel or fringe on the four corners of the outer garment, worn as a reminder to observe the commandments. And then it quotes the two verses that we looked at earlier. Now the same Greek word, which is translated hem, which is the very thing she touched, was the tassel. The same Greek word is found in Matthew chapter 14, verses 35 through 36. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent out into all that surrounding region, brought to him all who were sick, and begged him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. Same Greek word, crespodon, meaning tassel. And as many as touched it were made perfectly well. And so unlike some of the paintings you might see where he's even wearing a Greek uh, toga and a sun disc behind his head, he was actually a Jewish man. Now some might think this is just cultural, but as far as a Jewish man was concerned, it was from the scriptures and it was commanded, and so they did it. And for the Savior of mankind to have been able to walk the streets and have any respect at all among the Jewish people, he would have also kept this commandment. And so he would have worn the tassels. Now another thing one might not often think about is that since the Messiah was a Jew, he would actually have had a Jewish or Hebrew name. Now I once heard a comedian that said, if Jesus was Jewish, why did he have a Spanish name? Now we might laugh because we've all probably heard of the Latino ball player, you know, which had his name spelled like Jesus, but actually pronounced Jesus. And so where did the name Jesus originate? Well, believe it or not, the 1611 King James Version did not contain the name Jesus. Now here is a photo scan of the original 1611 King James Version. And you notice up here at the top left and it, where it says, And Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost, return from Jordan. And so it has I-E-S-U-S. -S. Now the reason why it has I-E-S-U-S -S rather than J-E-S-U-S -S is because the letter J was not normally used in the English language until sometime after 1611, somewhere around the mid-1600s. And somewhere along the line, the letter I actually changed to a J, in spite of the fact that the origin of I-E-S-U-S, -S, Yesus, is actually Latin, which contains no J sound. And so the name Jesus came from the Latin Yesus, and Yesus came from the Greek Yesus. And so where did the name Jesus come from? Well, let's again look back at the Strong's Concordance entry. It's Greek number, lexicon number 2424, Jesus, Iesus, from of Hebrew origin, and it has their 3091. And it has there Jesus, i.e. Jehoshua, the name of our Lord, and two, three other Israelites. And so the Messiah actually has the same name as two other Israelites, maybe three. So let's look at the number 3091 that it mentions here. That's of Hebrew origin. Now you see here in this listing here in Strong's, it says Yahushua, and it's from 3068 and 3467, 
Jehovah saved is what it has there. But for reasons we'll explain later in this seminar, the actual accurate pronunciation here is not Yehoshua, but Yahushua. And so Jesus comes from the Hebrew name Yahushua, which is often pronounced Yeshua in the Aramaic language. Now we see here the Messiah's name actually carries an important meaning in Hebrew. Now here they have Jehovah saved, but um, modern scholarship has demonstrated pretty clearly it's more correct to say Yahweh saves or Yahweh is salvation. And um, this meaning of the Messiah's name, Yahweh saved or Yahweh is salvation, actually is confirmed when you go to Matthew chapter 1, verse 21 where it says, And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Yahushua, for he will save his people from their sins. And so the scripture begins to make sense now that we understand the meaning of the Messiah's name. You should call his name Yahweh saves, for he will save his people from their sins. Now the context of this particular verse is the angel speaking to Joseph. And so it is the Heavenly Father who chose to name his son, not Jesus, but Yahushua. Now I do believe we should not change his name because it's too beautiful and too sacred for us to change. And the meaning of his name carries an important message. And since the name Jesus was due to changes that man has made, and the Messiah never really authorized we ought to just leave it just as our Heavenly Father gave it to us. This is the name, Yahushua. That is the name the disciples were praying in, baptizing in, healing in, and getting so much persecution for teaching in. Now I realize that names don't seem that important in our culture today. But in the scriptures and in the Jewish culture of the first century, Names were pretty important. Consider these scriptures, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Yahushua Messiah for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's a pretty important thing there about the name. And of course, Acts chapter 3, verse 6, the Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Yahushua, the Messiah of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And so, once again, a name is important. And when they uh, were set before the Sanhedrin there in Acts chapter 4, verse 7, it says, And when they set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? And then their response was, Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Yahushua, Messiah of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom Yahweh, that's the Heavenly Father's name, raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you whole. So a name is apparently important. Now look at this scripture, Acts chapter 4, verse 12. It says, Nor is there salvation in any other for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, does it sound like it would be a really good idea for us to change this name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved? Now, I'm not saying that anyone who uses the name Jesus is necessarily lost. I'm just trying to point out that names are important in Scripture, and we shouldn't go about changing names, especially the Messiah's name, because there is no other name under heaven good among men whereby we must be saved. And then Acts 4.17, they didn't like what he had to say, and they said, uh, but so it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Yahushua. And so, names were a big deal there in the first century assembly.
Now in Acts chapter 15, verse 14, it says, Simon has declared how Yahweh at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And so even the Gentiles are called to be a people who um, use his name as well. Acts chapter 21, verse 13 says, Then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Master Yahshua. And so, these scriptures pretty clearly demonstrate the importance of names. Now, of course, it is the person of Yahshua that saves us, I'm not trying to say a name alone or a phonetic pronunciation saves us. But we must wonder, if the Messiah is the same yesterday, today, and forever, why do people keep changing his name? And if we want to appreciate and understand the Hebrew roots of our faith, part of that is understanding that the Messiah's name was not a Greek name, it was not a Latin name, and it certainly wasn't an English name or a Spanish name. It was a Hebrew name. And he was a Hebrew. Part of loving him is loving the name the Heavenly Father gave him. Now speaking of Hebrew names, we talked a little bit about the Heavenly Father's name, which is Yahweh. The Encyclopedia Britannica talks about this, and I quote, Yahweh, the God of the Israelites, his name being revealed to Moses as four Hebrew consonants, Y-H-W-H, -H, called the Tetragrammaton, after the exile, 6th century B.C., and especially from the 3rd century B.C. on, Jews ceased to use the name Yahweh for two reasons. As Judaism became a universal religion through its proselytizing in the Greco-Roman world, the more common noun Elohim, meaning God, tended to replace Yahweh to demonstrate the universal sovereignty of Israel's God over all the others. At the same time, the divine name was increasingly regarded as too sacred to be uttered. It was thus replaced vocally in the synagogue ritual by the Hebrew word Adonai, my Lord, which was translated Kyrios, Lord, in the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament. And so we see here, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica and other references, you can look it up yourself. Even dictionaries will a lot of times give you this information. There was a Jewish tradition which began that stated that Yahweh's name was too sacred to be uttered. And so, for this reason, if you were to go into a Jewish synagogue today, you would not hear the Heavenly Father's name spoken. You would hear Adonai, which means my Lord, or Lord, when speaking in reference to Yahweh. Now the Messiah himself was not particularly fond of traditions of men. And he never participated in this tradition, because he actually said in his prayer, in John 17, verse 26, And I have declared to them your name. And will declare it that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. And again, John seventeen six, he says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now, nearly all modern Bibles, curiously, follow the tradition of removing Yahweh's name from the Bible and putting the Lord in its place. And if you take a moment to read the preface of your Bible, it will probably mention that they follow the tradition of removing Yahweh's name from the Scriptures. For instance, in the New International Version, the NIV preface, it says this, In regard to the divine name YHWH, that's Yahweh, commonly referred to as the Tetragrammaton, the translators adopted the device used in most English versions of rendering that name as LORD in capital letters, 
to distinguish it from Adonai, another Hebrew word rendered Lord, for which small letters are used. And so they're saying here, wherever you see capital L-O-R-D, that's where the name Yahweh stands in the original. And wherever you see capital L but lowercase O-R-D, that's where Adonai, meaning Lord in, he in Hebrew, is found in the original text. And so they actually admit that they do not carry over the Heavenly Father's name, but they follow that device used in most English translations. And so, what do they do? They change Yahweh to Lord. Now in light of this, and in light of the fact that the Messiah himself did not participate in this tradition, one must wonder how Yahweh himself must feel about people taking his name out of the Bible. Now one of the Ten Commandments actually talk about the importance of his name. And that's the third commandment. Now many take the third commandment, which says to not take his name in vain, to mean that we should not use the Heavenly Father's name alongside a swear word or profanity. Now I could see where it certainly might mean this. Others say taking his name in our lips while living a life of sin is another way of taking his name in vain. Well, I, I agree with this also. But let's take a moment here and look at the Webster's Dictionary definition of the word vain. The word vain has the following meaning. Having no real substance, value, or importance. Empty, void, worthless, unsatisfying, thy vain excuse. Destitute of forge or efficacy, effecting no purpose, fruitless, and ineffectual, as vain toil, a vain attempt. Now considering the meaning of the word vain, in what greater way could we bring Yahweh's name to emptiness, worthlessness, having no real substance, value, or purpose, than to remove his name altogether from Scripture and substitute it with a title of our own choosing? We know that we are not supposed to add or take away from the Scriptures. But in doing this, man has chosen to both add and take away. They add the Lord, they take away his name, Yahweh. Now his name is actually found in the scriptures over 7,000 times. And each one of those 7,000 times, man comes in and takes his name from our English Bibles and puts a title in its place, namely, the Lord. Now in light of these things, I don't feel right about participating in a tradition to remove his beautiful Hebrew name from the scriptures. I believe we need to return to the Hebrew roots of our faith. The Hebrew roots that the first century assembly was founded on. Now many of us use part of his name already when we say Hallelujah. Hallelujah means praise you, Yah with Yah being the first part of the name Yahweh. And his name is also found as part of the Messiah's name, Yahushua, which means Yahweh is salvation. And so, Hallelujah, Hallelujah means praise you, and Yah refers to Yahweh. And in the Messiah's name, Yahushua, that would be Yahweh is salvation. And even the names of the prophets, we find the name Yah, for instance, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Obadiah, and so on. Now some might say, well, I'm not Hebrew. Well, guess what? The Savior is Hebrew, and he lives in you. It's true that we don't speak Hebrew, but each one of these names here, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Obadiah, Zechariah, and so on are all Hebrew names. And yet we say those names all the time. In fact, the word Satan is from the Hebrew word Satan. And so his name is not changed. Why would we go about changing the most important name of all?
the Heavenly Father's name. And so we also wouldn't want to change the name of His Son either because it actually contains the name of the Father within His name, which we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Now speaking of the Messiah's name, Yahweh is salvation, did you know that the good news of salvation can actually be found in the Old Testament? Now it's kind of hidden in a way, it's somewhat of a mystery, but it can be found there. First of all, we find the plan of salvation in the feasts. Well, I'd like to take a moment here and explain how the Feast of Passover beautifully and fully describes and demonstrates Yahweh's awesome plan of salvation through the Messiah. What happened to the children of Israel in the land of Egypt was that they were placed under bondage. And that bondage was through the slavery to Pharaoh and the taskmasters. And so we have, I want to carry you through this whole thing from beginning to end. We have a full picture of our own salvation in the Messiah when we look at what happened to the children of Israel as they went from Egypt into the promised land. First of all, we need to recognize that there are symbologies here and uh, things that match up to our own life. The children of Israel, they were in bondage to Egypt. And we also were in bondage at some point in our life to the world. While the children of Israel um, were specifically in bondage to Pharaoh, who was the king of Egypt, and we also were in bondage to the ruler of this world, Satan. And Israel came up out of Egypt along with a mixed multitude. Now, you may not have known that already, but um, it wasn't just Israel that came out of the land of Egypt. There was a mixed multitude that went with them. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 37 through 39, it says, Then the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkot, about 600,000 men on foot, besides children. A mixed multitude went up with them also, and flocks and herds a great deal of livestock. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough, which they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened, because they were driven out of Egypt and could not wait. Nor had they prepared provisions for themselves. And so, the people of Israel went out of Egypt, but there was also some of the Gentiles there who were seeing the awesome works of Yahweh and saying, we want to go with you. And the same is true in the uh, New Covenant, new, the New Testament. Not only Israel is called out of the world, but Gentiles are also called out of the world to go with them, and they're joined together as one people. And in fact, many of you might be thinking, well, the Old Testament, isn't that with the Jews and, and, the, and the New Testament really for Gentiles? Or the Old Covenant, isn't that with the people of Israel and the New Covenant, that's with, it, that's with the Gentiles? No, not at all. In fact, it says in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, it says, Behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of of Judah. So the new covenant is actually with Israel and Judah, just as the old covenant was with Israel and Judah. Now Yahweh sent plagues down upon the Egyptians, and um, he was doing this to demonstrate his superiority over all the gods of Egypt. And it was true also in our life at some time we began to recognize that the Heavenly Father was superior to all the gods of this age, whether it be drugs or wine or whatever. We, we found that He was superior. And the children of Israel were told to take a lamb of the first year and sacrifice that lamb 
between the evenings at the ninth hour. And um, that lamb's blood would be placed on the doorposts of their homes. And when the death angel came over, it would pass over the houses of those who had the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, and they would not face the death of the firstborn. Now the Messiah in the scriptures is referred to as our Passover. And that's also what the lamb was called. The lamb was called the Passover lamb. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you are truly, you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Messiah, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. And so the Messiah is our Passover lamb that saves us from death, just as they had a Passover lamb that saved them from death. Now, they would take that lamb, before they actually killed the lamb, they would take it aside and examine it for three days. As it says in Exodus chapter 12, verse 3, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of this month every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. We'll also find, if you examine the timing of the Messiah's entry to Jerusalem, until the time that he was actually um, taken and put to death was about three days. And so he was examined quite often and questioned by the crowds and the, and the Jewish people. And in the same way, they would take a lamb aside and examine it three days, make sure it had no blemish, didn't have any kind of diseases or anything like that. And the Passover lamb, as we mentioned earlier, was sacrificed at the ninth hour, commonly known as the time between the evenings. And that's Exodus chapter 12, verse 6. It says, Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. Now the word translated twilight literally means between the evenings. It's probably not a very good translation. Now the book of Josephus, Josephus being a first century historian who was alive during the time that the, first, that the temple actually still stood, is describing what took place on the day of Passover. It says these high priests, upon coming of their feast, which is called Passover, when they slay their sacrifices from the ninth hour to the eleventh. And so they actually would slay the Passover lamb from the ninth hour until the eleventh hour. We're going to find out that the Messiah was also slain at the ninth hour on the day of Passover. And Luke chapter 23 verses 44 through 46. Now it was about the sixth hour and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Yahushua had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the spirit. And so it was about the ninth hour that he actually died for us. In John chapter 1, verse 29, it says, The next day John saw Yahushua coming toward him, and said, Behold, the Lamb of Yahweh who takes away the sin of the world. And so the Messiah is called the Lamb for one reason. He is the Passover Lamb. He is our Passover that saves us from death and delivers us from the world, from Egypt. And so there are a lot of um, Christians and, and everything that call him the Lamb, but I wonder how many actually recognize the reason why he's called the Lamb. And uh, many of the songs and, and praise hymns and so on that refer to him say, Worthy is the Lamb. And even in Revelation chapter 5, verse 12 says, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. But how many know that the reason why he's called the Lamb is because he is 
our Passover lamb, that was slain for us at the ninth hour, the exact hour that the Passover lambs were being slaughtered in Jerusalem. And so he fulfilled that timing beautifully and perfectly. And of course, the blood was placed on the doorpost of the homes in Exodus chapter 12. And the reason why is because the life is in the blood. And in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. And of course, his blood is placed on the doorposts of our hearts. His life is within us. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, it says, I have been crucified with Messiah. It is no longer I who live, but Messiah lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of Yahweh, who loved me and gave himself for me. And so his life is now dwelling upon us. And because he lives, we live. And so the blood on the doorposts of their home, the life being placed on their, on their dwelling places, is matching up with the understanding that the Messiah, his life, is dwelling and living in us. Now the Passover lamb was actually eaten. They would uh, roast it and they would eat it. Now the Messiah, he said, in Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 28. It says, And as they were eating, Yahushua took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new, t new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And so, in the same way that the children of Israel would actually partake of the lamb which was sacrificed, we also partake of the Messiah who was sacrificed for us, our Passover. Isn't that beautiful? How many of us understand that when we're partaking of him, we're actually partaking of the Passover lamb that was slain for us? And when we partake of the bread, the unleavened bread, which is sinless, we're partaking of him, his body, which is not leavened, which was without sin. And when we partake of his blood, his life being placed in us, that represents our cleansing. Now it says in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 10 through 12, we're going to look at the first fruits of and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which follow the day of Passover. It says, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before Yahweh to be accepted on your behalf on the day after the Sabbath the priest shall wave it. And you shall offer on that day when you wave the sheaf a male lamb of the first year without blemish as a burnt offering to Yahweh. Now, so they would take a sheaf of the barley, the very first fruits of the sheaf, the barley, and they would wave it before Yahweh. Well, the Messiah is called the first fruits also. And the timing that they would actually do this would be the day after the Sabbath during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which followed Passover. And the Messiah is called the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 20 through 23 but now messiah is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep for since by man came death by man also came the resurrection of the dead for as in adam all die even so in messiah all shall be made alive but each one in his own order messiah the first fruits afterward those who are messiahs at his coming and so for the first fruits we understand 
that Yahshua is the first fruits in the same way they would take the first fruits of the ground and they would wave it before Yahweh Yahshua the Messiah was the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep and was resurrected and then the feast of unleavened bread which actually was during first was uh, something that occurred right after Passover and first fruits was within that feast um, what does the unleavened bread represent? Well, it represents sinlessness because we find in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, he says, Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Messiah, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast not with old leaven nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Let us keep the feast. And so the first fruits is representing the resurrection of Yahshua the Messiah and our unleavened state as a result of partaking of the Passover, which is Yahshua. And that's commonly called the Eucharist today. And uh, they've kind of changed it in some kind of a a different ritual, separate from Passover. But the reality is, we are supposed to be partaking of the Passover. When? Not every Sunday. Some think, well, because they broke bread. Well, they broke bread every day. That was a normal thing. But the Messiah actually died for us on the day of Passover. And then they would partake of that Passover that following night. And so, if we understand that we are supposed to do this in remembrance of Him, then why don't we do that at the time that He actually died for us? As an anniversary of when He died for us. I think we should. Now we know the children of Israel, they left Egypt behind them. In the same way, we also have to be willing to put the world behind us once we are delivered, saved by the blood of the Lamb, and are now cleansed. And we find also that Israel crossed the Sea of Reeds, or the Red Sea, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1-4, through 4, it says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Kind of interesting. All ate the spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Messiah. And so... As they went through the Sea of Reeds, the Red Sea, that was a type of baptism. And what do we do after we receive the Messiah? We get baptized, don't we? And so it just fits perfectly. And Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Yahshua Messiah for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit. Now, speaking of baptism, if you go to Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. It would almost seem a contradiction, because in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, they were baptizing in the name of the Son. But in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Yahshua actually commanded that they be baptizing people in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. How do these two scriptures reconcile with one another? Well, there are huge denominations actually built over that very question and divisions in the body over that question. But if we understand that the Messiah did not have a Greek name, he was not a Greek, but he had a Jewish Hebrew name because he was a Jew, and the Heavenly Father 
also has a Hebrew name, these two scriptures actually do not contradict at all. Let's look closely at the name of the Messiah. Now we know that the name Yahushua actually contains the name of the Father within it. Y-A-H refers to Yahweh, and it means Yahweh is salvation. And so the Heavenly Father's name is actually found within the Messiah's name. And so every time we say the Savior's name, Yahushua, we are actually also saying the name of the Heavenly Father, because the name of the Heavenly Father is within the name of the Son. Now, so if we were to baptize somebody in the name of Yahushua, we are baptizing someone in the name of the Father and the name of the Son. Now what about the Holy Spirit? It says in John 14, verse 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things I have said to you. And so the Holy Spirit comes in the Son's name, Yahushua. And so if we were to baptize the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we would only need to use the name Yahushua. And it makes perfect sense, because in John chapter 5, verse 43, Yahushua said the following. He said, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. That's kind of interesting. Now, he not only came in his Father's literal written name, he also came in his Father's character as well. And so, when we get baptized, we want to get baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that can only be found in the name Yahushua. You will not find the name of the Father in the name Jesus. You will not find the name of the Son, actually, in the name Jesus. The name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit can be found in Yahushua. Now, going back to our analogies here, we know that the children of Israel, once they were baptized in the sea, in the cloud, the cloud being the Holy Spirit, they went through this wilderness. And in this wilderness, they were given the law of Yahweh, also called the Torah. And he tested them, and he tried them, and he caused them to suffer. In Deuteronomy chapter 20, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 through 3, it says, You shall remember that Yahweh, your mighty one, led you all the way these forty years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of Yahweh. And so they were learning the will of Yahweh. He thundered his commandments from Mount Sinai. He gave them the law so they would understand the right way to walk. And we also, after we have been baptized, we begin to learn more and more about what our Father desires of us. And um, we're going to find out that what He required of them is very much the same as what He desires out of us. And so we also learn the will of Yahweh. Now, we are not saved by the law. I would never suggest such a thing. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 11, it says, But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of Yahweh is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Now this is Paul speaking here. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, is what he's quoting from. It says, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. And so, what does it mean to be just? It means to be righteous. 
or to be declared right. If I said I'm justified, that means I have been declared righteous. And so, in the same way the children of Israel were not ever justified by the law, neither are we. Because the law cannot declare us righteous if we've broken it. Paul talks about this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 12 through 14. We continue reading here. It says, Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Now, has anybody done them? Of course not. Nobody has ever kept the commandments perfectly from life to death, except one, and that is the Messiah. But it says the man who does them shall live by them. Now, if we had actually kept the law, then, yeah, we could be saved by the law. But the fact is we are cursed because we have broken the law. Now, the Messiah, verse 13, has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So the Messiah, he actually received the curse that we deserved for breaking the commandments, because on him was laid the sin of us all. And on us, we get the blessing. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Messiah Yahshua, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And so our sin was placed on him in order that the blessing of Abraham, which is eternal life, might come upon us. As it says in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 6 through 7, All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And Yahweh has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a, as a lamb to the slaughter. Indeed, he was a lamb. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And so we are actually saved because the Messiah was cursed instead of us. On him was laid our sin. And so, what is the blessing of Abraham that is placed upon us? Well, Abraham was actually promised by Yahweh. He said, in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And so through Abraham's seed, which we understand now today to be the Messiah, through Messiah all nations of the earth will be blessed. And so Abraham's children were the chosen ones to bless all the earth through the Messiah, who was a Jew who was a son of Abraham. And so what do we need to do in order to receive Yahshua? In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, we read again, Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Yahshua the Messiah for remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so we have to repent. Now this is Peter speaking here. He's speaking to the crowd of Jews. And Paul, who is referring to his ministry here to the Gentiles, and he's talking to King Agrippa in his defense, and he says, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent Turn to Yahweh and do works befitting repentance. And so we have to repent, don't we? What does it mean to repent? It doesn't mean that you instantly become perfect. What it does mean is that you have made a decision to turn away from sin. You've made a decision that you no longer want to walk in your former ways. 
And in uh, Acts chapter 3, verse 19, it says, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of Yahweh. And in Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 30 through 31, Yahweh said the same thing to the house of Israel. He says, Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, says the Master Yahweh. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Israel? And so the same message is given to both Jew and Gentile. Repent. Turn away from transgression. Turn away from sin. In Romans chapter 10, verses 9, 9 through 13, it says, If you confess with your mouth the Master Yahshua and believe in your heart that Yahweh has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so in our heart, our belief is going to bring us to righteousness, to a righteous walk. We're going to turn away from unrighteousness and toward righteousness. And with our mouth, we, can make, our, we make our confession that we receive him. And scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same master is over, over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of Yahweh shall be saved. Isn't that interesting? I guess the name is important. And he says there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. If there's no distinction between Jew and Greek, why is it? that in so many religions and churches today we, we see a big distinction between Jew and Greek. Now I want to point out here that everyone is called to turn away from sin. Now what is sin? What does it mean to sin? If we're supposed to repent, what is it that we're supposed to be repenting from? What are we turning away from? What is exact what is sin exactly? Well, in first John chapter three, verse four, it says, Whoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. In Romans chapter six, verses one through two, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Yahweh forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer? therein. And so we're not to sin and we know that sin is transgressing the law and so what does this mean? We should not continue transgressing the law, right? And in fact we are dead to those things, to transgressing the law. And in Romans chapter 6 verse 15 it says, What then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace, Yahweh forbid. And so the fact that we are not under the law's condemnation does not mean that we are free to transgress that law. So we're not under the law, but we're not above the law either. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek, and Paul is writing to the Romans here. And he says, in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, he says, By the law is the knowledge of sin. So the, the actual the law that Yahweh gave to the children of Israel teaches us what sin is and sin isn't. And in Romans chapter 7, verse 7, he says, I had not known sin, but by the law. And so as Israel did, when they went through that wilderness... We also learn what sin is by hearing the law. And so when they learned the will of Yahweh, they learned the right way to live by hearing the law of Yahweh. And so do we. 
And to turn away from sin is to turn away from transgressing that law that Yahweh gave. And in fact, the law was given from Mount Sinai. He gave Ten Commandments, but he also gave other commandments. And um, that was just about the time that the children of Israel would have been observing the feast called Pentecost, or Feast of Weeks, also known as Shavuot in Hebrew. Well, it's kind of interesting, because the law was given around the time of Pentecost. Now, Yahushua the Messiah said in John chapter 6, verse 63, he says, It is a spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. And so his words that he speaks are spirit. Now, the Messiah is also called the Word in John chapter 1. It says, John 1, 14, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so, he is called the Word, and the words he speaks are spirit, and they are life. Now, what is the new covenant? In Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33, it says, This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel in those days, says Yahweh. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. Now, if the Messiah is called the Word, and the words he speaks are spirit and are life, then when the Messiah is dwelling in us, that means that the law, because he is the word, is placed in our minds and written on our hearts. That's the new covenant. That's the goal of the new covenant. To have the living word made flesh that dwelt among us, Yahshua the Messiah, dwelling in us so that his word, his spirit, his son, his law, is in our minds, written on our hearts. It was all predicted in Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 to 27. He said, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. And so when the Messiah dwells in us, it is supposed to be no longer we who live, it's supposed to be he who lives in us. And that occurs because his spirit indwelling in us. And Yahweh said also in Ezekiel eighteen thirty one through 32 he said, Cast away from you all the transgressions which you've committed, and get yourselves a new heart, a new spirit, for why should you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Master Yahweh. Therefore, turn and live. In other words, repent and live. And so, we have all, Galatians 2.20, been crucified with Messiah. It's no longer we who live, it's Messiah who lives in us. And the life which we live in the flesh, we live by faith in the Son of Yahweh, who, gave, who loved us and gave himself for us. Now it says in 1 John chapter 2, Verse 6, it says, He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Just as he walked. Now, how did, how did the Messiah walk? Didn't he walk a sinless walk? He never sinned a single time, right? And so, when we claim to abide in him, we also need to walk a sinless walk. Now, if we fail... Yes, 
We confess our sins and we get cleansed. But the goal, the intent of the Messiah's indwelling is not only to save us, but to give us the power to walk out the commandments of Yahweh. And so the Holy Spirit dwells within us. The Word dwells within us because the Messiah is the Word. And that produces what? Obedience to every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Yahweh, no matter when he said it or where. And so there's a difference. We who receive the new covenant, we understand that we no longer live according to our own flesh. We live according to the Spirit. Because the Spirit dwells in us causing us to walk in obedience. And proof of this is also found in Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 7. It says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Why? Because the carnal mind is enmity, against Yahweh, for it is not subject to the law of Yahweh, nor indeed can be. And so, contrary to what you may have been taught, the law of Yahweh is not abolished in the sense that we are free to disobey it now. We are supposed to be subject to His law, because the Messiah lives and dwells in us, and therefore he wants to do in us the things that he did when he walked this earth, and that is keep the Father's commandments. Now, invariably, people will say, well, if you keep the law, then why don't you go around and stone people? Well, let me give you an illustration here. There are different aspects to law. For instance, in American law, we understand there's a moral law which defines right and wrong, and that is keep your speed at 65 miles an hour on some of the interstates that you see out there. That would be the posted speed limit. And that it would be wrong for anyone to go past that speed limit. Now, if they chose to violate that moral law and decide to go 75 miles an hour, then they might get pulled over and there would be a punishment given for violating that law. You pay a fine and you get points against you on your driver's license. Well, Yahweh's law is no different. There is a moral law which defines right and wrong. That's sin. And that is, for instance, do not murder. We understand that's wrong to murder. And then there's a punishment given for someone who violates that law. And that would be the murderer should be put to death. And so there's a difference between the punishment of violating the law and the actual moral law itself. Now, we don't go around and pull people over, do we? Do we go around and pull people over ourselves and say, hey, you just broke the speed limit? You know, when that guy passed you on the freeway, do you uh, wave your arms and, and tell him to pull over and... and um, Tell him he has to pay a fine, and um, and uh, you report him. He gets he gets uh, points against him as driver's light. No. In the same way, the judges and those who are in civil authority in the land are the ones who have that role. The same was true of ancient Israel. It wasn't ever intended that the common man just walk up to somebody and stone them for doing something wrong. That was a commandment given to the judges so that they would administer punishment in a society that was based on keeping Yahweh's commandments. And in fact, our own society here in the United States agrees with this particular uh, punishment here that's listed in Scripture, that a murderer is put to death, and there are people who are put to death for the crime of murder, even here in the United States. But we don't just walk up to the murderer and, and shoot him. There's a process. And the same was true in Yahweh's law. And so, if we say that we want to keep Yahweh's law, 
Does that mean we go around and, and um, stone people? No, that's supposed to be intended for judges of a land and of a country that chooses to live and abide by the scriptural principles. But the scriptural principle which defines sin, which tells us right from wrong, is do not murder, and so we don't murder. And that's the portion of the law that was intended for the common man. And there were other portions of Yahweh's law, such as giving sacrifices and so on, but those were commands for the priests. And both of those aspects, the punishment and the redemptive aspects of the law, had to do with what you do when sin happens. They may have to make an offering or something like that. But the actual moral underlying moral law is unchangeable. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not commit adultery, and so on. And so, for us today, if we want to keep Yahweh's law, we will keep these things to keep ourselves from sin. And there are other things in Yahweh's law as well, which are not very popular, such as keep the Sabbath. That's part of the Ten Commandments, right? And uh, the Sabbath was never called Sunday in Scripture. All right, so getting back to our analogies here, we find that Joshua, son of Nun, was actually the one who caused them to cross the Jordan and enter the Promised Land. Moses was not able to bring them to the uh, Land of Promise because he himself had sinned. Now I want to share with you a very fascinating fact about this. Joshua is the same name as the Messiah's name. And in fact, if you go to your King James Version in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 8, it says, For if Jesus had given them rest, then he would have not afterward spoken of another day. Now, that particular verse is kind of interesting because it's not talking about the Messiah. It's, called, it's actually talking about Joshua, son of Nun, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 8. And all the other modern translations actually correct that and put Joshua there. But the reason why it has Jesus is because it has Jesus in the Greek, which we talked about earlier, comes from Yahushua. And so Joshua, or Yahushua, is the same name as our Savior, which provides a very fascinating analogy. And that is, Moses can show us the way of righteousness and show us the right way to live, but the law does not save us. The law can tell us what righteousness is and what unrighteousness is. But Moses himself failed to keep his own law. And as a result, Yahweh forbade him from entering the land. But there's a lesson here. Moses could not take them across to Jordan, but there was a man named Yahushua who was able to do it. In the same way in our own walk, the law of Moses cannot take us across to Jordan and cannot save us. It takes a man named Yahushua to carry us across the Jordan. And so the whole story of the children of Israel from Egypt to the Promised Land is a beautiful picture of our own salvation. And in fact, we find in Zechariah chapter 6, a prediction that the Messiah's name was going to be Yahshua. And um, it says in verse 9 through 13, it says, Then the word of Yahweh came to me, saying, Receive the gift from the captives, from Heldai, Tobiah, and Jediah, who have come from Babylon, and go the same day and enter the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Take the silver and gold, Make an elaborate crown and set it on the head of Joshua, that's Yahushua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. Then speak to him, saying, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, saying, Behold the man 
whose name is the branch. Now, if you know anything at all about Messianic prophecy, the branch is a reference to the coming Messiah. And so this man, Yahushua, actually had the name of the branch. And so he said, take the silver and gold, make this crown, and put it on the head of Yahushua, and say, behold, the man whose name is the branch. And he's making a messianic prophecy here, because this high priest, Joshua, never did fulfill this. But he said, he makes this messianic prophecy. He says, from his place he shall branch out, he shall build the temple of Yahweh. Now we are the temple, aren't we? Yes, he shall build the temple of Yahweh. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on his throne. And he shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. And so, Yahushua the Messiah is a king on the throne. He's also a priest. And so, this man named Yahushua that lived at this time, and Zechariah was, was actually uttering these prophecies, contained the name of the branch. Now, if you're looking for scriptures that would show the Messiah is called the branch, look at uh, Jeremiah 33, 15. It says, In those days at that, that, at that time I will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. Also, Jeremiah 23, verse 5. It says, Behold, the days are coming that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness, a king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. And so the Messiah's name is predicted in the book of Zechariah, chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. And that's pretty exciting. And so we understand now that Yahushua was the one who led them, the children of Israel, to the promised land. That's what they called him. When, when they were crossing the Jordan, they understand. They understood that it was Yahushua who was leading them. Now, not Yahushua the Messiah, but Yahushua the son of Nun. And um, we also understand that it's Yahushua who takes us to the promised land. Hallelujah. Now, we have covered two feasts here. One is the Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the second one is Pentecost, when the law was given, also the time that the Spirit was poured out in Acts chapter 2. And isn't that kind of an interesting parallel, that the law is given and the Spirit is given on Pentecost. And, of course, we read earlier where the Messiah is the living Word, and the words He speaks are Spirit and are truth. And so... The Spirit was poured out in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. And what did they do? They spoke the word, except they spoke in every man's language where they were born, speaking in tongues. And so that feast, Pentecost, is fulfilled and seen in our own life as well when we are given the Spirit. And so Yahushua led them to the promised land, and of course we know Yahushua is the one going to lead us to the promised land. Now, the next feast uh, that's mentioned is quite some time later. It's approximately four months or so after Pentecost, and it's called the Feast of Trumpets. And it's in the fall, sometime around September, typically. And the Feast of Trumpets... is very fascinating because Yahweh said in Leviticus chapter 23 verse 24 he says speak unto the children of Israel saying in the seventh month in the first day of the month shall you have a Sabbath a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation and so that was a command that they would blow the trumpets on this particular feast and uh, the seventh month corresponds to again September maybe early October and we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 through 52, it says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, 
in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed now we know that the messiah we see here is going to return at the last trumpet and so we have just talked about how the messiah is our passover lamb and the spirit is given on pentecost and we learn the will of yahweh and so on and then we know the messiah is going to return right that's the next step for us and so the feast of trumpets the messiah's return at the last trump and then the next feast the day of atonement representing the atonement we receive in the messiah as a result of his perfect work he entered the holy of holies as the high priest does on the day of atonement and um, makes atonement for us and then the the feast which follows the day of atonement is called the feast of tabernacles and the uh, feast of tabernacles representing the fact that Yahweh will tabernacle with men and also our temporariness in this tabernacle our bodies in this world the places we dwell are all temporary but one day Yahweh will tabernacle with us and the feast of tabernacles is mentioned in Leviticus chapter 23 verses 39 through 42 it says also in the 15th day of the seventh month when you have gathered in the fruit of the land you shall keep a feast unto Yahweh seven days on the first day shall be a Sabbath and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath and so two of those days during the Feast of Tabernacles are days of rest and you shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees branches of palm trees and the boughs of thick trees and willows of the brook and you shall rejoice before Yahweh your mighty one seven days and you shall keep it a feast unto Yahweh seven days in the year it shall be a statute forever in your generations you shall celebrate it in the seventh month you shall dwell in booths seven days now this is kind of interesting you might think well this is for Israel right well the days are going to come according to the book of Zechariah chapter 14 that um, it's going to be revealed who Yahweh really wants to be keeping his feast days we're going to read through the book of Zechariah chapter 14 here verses 1 through 3 and we're going to read through the whole chapter it says behold the day of Yahweh is coming and your spoil will be divided in your midst for I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then Yahweh will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east and the mount of olives shall be split in two from east to west making a very large valley half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south now of course that's never happened the mount of olives is still intact isn't it then you shall flee through my mountain valley for the mountain valley shall reach to azal Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus Yahweh, my mighty one, will come, and all the saints with you. It shall come to pass in that day that there will be no light. The lights will diminish. It shall be one day which is known to Yahweh, neither day nor night. But at evening time it shall happen that it will be light. Now, of course, that's never happened, right? And in that day it shall be that living waters shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea, and half of them toward the western sea. In both summer and winter it shall occur. And Yahweh shall be king over all the earth. And that day it shall be Yahweh is one, and his name one. No more the Lord and Hashem and Adonai, one name. All the land shall be turned into a plain from Geba to Ramon south of Jerusalem. 
and that's still hilly right now as we speak, but it's going to be turned into a plain. Yahweh is going to do some landscaping for us. Jerusalem shall be raised up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate to the place of the first gate and the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananiel to the king's wine presses. The people shall dwell in it, and no longer shall there be utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. No more utter destruction, no more uh, suicide bombers and bombs, so on. And this shall be the plague with which Yahweh will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets, and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. Pretty serious plague. Almost sounds like nuclear war, doesn't it? It shall come to pass in that day that a great panic from Yahweh will be among them. Every one will seize the hand of his neighbor and raise his hand against his neighbor's hand. And it shall come to pass, this is the fascinating part here, it shall come to pass that every one who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, Yahweh of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. And so everyone, both Jew and Gentile, are going to be keeping the feast of tabernacles. That is predictive prophecy. It's going to happen. Verse 17, It shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, Yahweh of hosts, on them there will be no rain. You see, the Feast of Tabernacles is intended to be a time of rejoicing for the goodness that Yahweh gives. It's actually sort of like our Thanksgiving in America here, except it's actually commanded. It says, that he will send no rain upon the nations that do not come up and give him thanks for the good things that he's given. It says, If the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague with which Yahweh strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And so, Yahweh's intent actually was that all of Egypt would have come with Israel and um, enjoy them, not just the mixed multitude, but, um, of course, many of them were stubborn. And we have here, it says, the family of Egypt is being required to come up and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Why is he mixing Jew and Gentile together? This is interesting. Now, this shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And so... I think part of understanding the Hebrew roots of our faith is understanding that it is not the will of the Heavenly Father for the body of the Messiah to be fragmented into two separate camps. He said, we are all one, Jew or Gentile, we are all one. He never says, Jews, you keep the Sabbath on the seventh day of the week, and Gentiles, you meet on a different day. That's called division. And for some reason, many assume that Jews are supposed to meet on the seventh day and Gentiles on the first, but that's not true. There is no scripture anywhere in the Bible where Yahweh says he wants to keep the Jews and Gentiles separated. In fact, in the Old Testament, he actually invited the Gentiles to keep the Sabbath and said he would bless them for it. In Isaiah chapter 56, verses 2 through 3, it says, Blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who lays hold on it, who keeps from defiling the Sabbath, and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Do not let the son of the foreigner who has joined himself to Yahweh speak, saying, Yahweh has utterly separated me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, Here I am, a dry tree. For thus says Yahweh, 
to the eunuchs who keep my sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant even to them will i give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters i will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off also the sons of the foreigner verse six who join themselves to yahweh that's the gentiles who want to join themselves to yahweh to serve him and to love the name of yahweh jewish hebrew name right to be his servants every one who keeps from defiling the sabbath see that the gentiles also defile the sabbath if you keep yourself from defiling the sabbath he says and hold fast my covenant even to them i will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer and so yahweh wanted all along both jew and gentile to be in one camp in one place on one day worshiping him now today some believe the commandment to keep the sabbath can be kept just by resting one day out of seven maybe they'll keep tuesday or or, or sunday or whatever it doesn't matter which day you keep but i'd like you to look at the sabbath commandment actually which is seen here in the ten commandments yahweh said in exodus chapter twenty verse eight he said remember the sabbath day to keep it holy now nowhere in scripture do we ever see an example where any day of the week is ever called the sabbath except the seventh day of the week even the new testament when it says that paul reasoned in the synagogue on the sabbath he wasn't saying he reasoned in the synagogue on the first day of the week he was saying he reasoned in the synagogue on the sabbath which is the seventh day of the week and the seventh day they were keeping historically the seven day week has not changed from that day until now you can look it up through history we are basically keeping the same roman calendar in our culture today that Julius Caesar had implemented in 46 BC approximately 40 some years before Messiah came and so the week has not changed and Yahweh blessed that seventh day we know the Messiah kept the seventh day he kept it correctly and that's all the further we need to go it says he blessed the seventh day and sanctified it in Genesis chapter 2 verse 3 and so Yahweh had made sure that his day never got lost or changed and he blessed a specific day and he says remember that specific day the sabbath day to keep it holy and that's the day he sanctified now if we decided that we were going to um, keep another day holy would that make any sense no because there is no other day that's even holy to begin with and so for us to keep another day holy it's not even sanctified by Yahweh to begin with is pretty much a waste of time we're not keeping the day holy that he sanctified and so Yahweh made this day holy at creation over two thousand years before there was ever a Jewish man on the earth Now I want to give an illustration here that will further demonstrate what I'm trying to say. Suppose a man had seven sheep. And he told his son, Son, we have seven sheep in our flock. But the seventh sheep standing over there next to the fence, whom we call Dolly, I want you to take the wool from that seventh sheep and bring it back to me and your mother is going to make clothing out of it and he said I want you to take the wool from that sheep because I've set that sheep aside as being special and the son went up on the pasture and he looked at the seven sheep and he decided that he was going to shear the sheep that his father did not tell him to shear he decided he was going to shear the first sheep he liked the wool better and he felt it was a, it was a better quality and gray wool and so he he sheared 
the wool of the first sheep, and he brought the wool back to his father. And so the question is, did he do what his father commanded him to do? No, he did not. Well, the Heavenly Father has given us a special day, the seventh day of the week, that he commanded us to keep holy because he decided to sanctify it at creation. If we go along and decide to keep another day holy, we're not doing our Father's will, are we? And so in light of the fact that Christianity has Hebrew roots, not Greek roots, but has Hebrew roots, we need to return to the Hebrew roots of our faith and understand that the Sabbath day really isn't just for Jews. It's for Jews and Gentiles and anyone who wants to join themselves unto our Creator. So where along the line did Christianity decide it was going to divorce itself from its Hebrew roots? Well, if you go back to the time of the first century, there was a tremendous amount of persecution going on. And the reason why there was a lot of persecution going on toward Jews was because in 70 AD, the Jews decided that they were going to rise up against the Roman power and try to overthrow it and establish their own nation. Now, suppose for a moment that there was a segment of the population in the United States, let's say the, the Mexicans in Texas or something, all banded together and tried to rise up against the United States. And um, there was a, they were fighting against the United States, but the United States came in and overthrew them. And there was all kinds of trouble and turmoil, loss of life, uh, thousands of people died, as a result of that war. What do you think everyone's attitude would be toward Mexican culture in the United States after a war like that? Probably wouldn't be very positive, right? Well, in 70 AD, the Jews had risen up against Rome. And so we can already see there was a tremendous amount of tension between Jews and Gentiles just by reading the book of Acts and, and other verses in the New Testament as well. But when that happened... There was even more persecution toward the Jews, and especially toward anything that made you look Jewish. And of course, Sabbath keeping and keeping commandments like kosher and different things would make you look very Jewish. And especially if you wore tassels and um, did other things that Yahweh had commanded in the law. And so there was a tremendous amount of societal pressure to not come along in the areas of the law that would make you look Jewish. And so they decided at some point that they were going to start meeting on the first day of the week, which was the day of the sun, which was more comfortable for Gentiles um, since they did worship the sun, and uh, instead of the Sabbath day. And they come up with a couple verses to give them an excuse, even though those verses never ever said that the Sabbath has been changed, and um, start meeting on that day instead. And so in that whole thing that happened from uh, the late 1st century, um, early 2nd, and there's actually a prediction in the, in the Scriptures um, which talks about this falling away, but uh, we don't have time to cover that yet on this video. But anyway, through that whole insurrection, the anti-Semitism rose up even more, and there were ensuing persecutions and battles between Jew and Gentile, and then later in the second century, the Bar Kokhba revolt, um, it was so bad, and so many people had lost their lives, um, that there is a tremendous amount of even more persecution between Jew and Gentile. So anything that looked Jewish 
you are going to end up being persecuted for doing. In Romans chapter 11, verse 7 through 11, it says, Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have attained it, and the rest were blinded. What did it seek? It sought righteousness, right? It sought to have salvation. It sought to dwell in the promised land forever and ever. But Israel did not obtain it. Only the elect of Israel actually obtained it. Paul was a Jew. Peter was a Jew. James was a Jew. John, they all were Jews. And so the elect obtained it, but the rest were blinded. And it was actually predicted that was going to happen, just as it is written, Yahweh has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear to this very day. And David said, says, Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so they do not see, and bow down their back always. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Isn't that interesting? The reason why we have a situation where the Jews are blinded was so that the Gentiles would, would receive salvation and provoke them to jealousy. Now let me ask you a question. Do we see anything here that would provoke a Jewish man to jealousy? And do we see anything here that would provoke a Jew to jealousy? Now you notice the uh, picture there on the left. There's a sign in front of the building, a big sign there, Hog Roast. And... Um, of course, there's a roasted hog there on the right, and then below that, an advertisement for the pig roast at the um, local church there, St. Thomas Mission Committee. Now, how about this photo? these photos here? Do you think that uh, there's anything here that would provoke a Jewish man to jealousy? And on the, on the right there is the, uh, it's called the Easter Bunny. You know, the origin of Easter, the actual word Easter, look, let's look that up here. It says, Easter, it says, the old English Easter from Ostron, a goddess of fertility and sunrise whose feast was celebrated at the spring equinox. And so the very word Easter is the name of a goddess, the goddess of fertility, and that's why, you know, Rabbits, which are very fertile, are pretty common. The bunny rabbits, Easter rabbits, and the eggs, and so on. All for fertility symbols. You see anything here in Easter that would provoke a Jewish man to jealousy? Shouldn't we be keeping Passover? Knowing that the Messiah himself is called our Passover? That was sacrificed for us? Absolutely. We need to turn away from these Greek things, these idolatrous named feasts, and start keeping the ones that Yahweh himself commanded. There's so much more blessing in that, and there's so much more that's going to provoke a Jewish man to jealousy in that. And as a result of people like us who are keeping these feasts, who are keeping the Sabbath day, who are returning to the Hebrew roots of our faith and understanding that the Messiah was not Greek, he was Jewish, and that he lives in us and dwells in us, causing us to do the things that he did. Through that understanding, there are many Jews today who are starting to find the Messiah and are being provoked to jealousy. All these years of Christian tradition 
and they've never really seen what the Messiah was actually like. He was a commandment keeper, not a commandment breaker. He was not a sinner. He was a perfect man who kept every one of the Father's commandments. You know, Messianic congregations are popping up in most every city here in the United States. And there are also many in the land of Israel. You see, Christianity is a religion that has its origins in first century Judaism. And if we choose to separate ourselves from Jews and Jewish things, then we also need to separate ourselves from Peter, James, John, Mark, Matthew, and all the other Jewish believers of the first century. We have to separate ourselves from Paul, who was also Jewish. And if so if we reject things on the basis that they're Jewish, well, we have to refuse the Messiah too, because he was Jewish. Now I've explained in detail how the feast days are a beautiful scriptural picture of the Messiah. Think back, the Passover, him being the lamb, the first fruits, him being the first fruits, the unleavened bread, our unleavened state when we partake of the Passover lamb without sin, the giving of the, the Spirit and the giving of the law on Pentecost, the return of the Messiah with the Feast of Trumpets, the Messiah entering the Holy of Holies for us, so that we would receive atonement and our tabernacling with Yahweh forever and ever. Don't these sound like things that point to Him and things that we ought to be participating in because they do point to Him? Instead of saying, well, Messiah fulfilled all that, which I know He did, why don't we say because they point to Messiah, we ought to keep them. Because the Messiah did fulfill them, we need to fulfill them. Because we need to live as he lived. We need to do the things that he did. He kept every one of the Father's commands, and so should we. It was never intended to be ignored. And we saw in Zechariah 14, when the Heavenly Father's will is finally done, both Jew and Gentile are coming together to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And so if the feast days are such a beautiful scriptural picture of the Messiah, why would we want to ignore them? In Numbers chapter 15, verse 16, Yahweh said, One law and one manner shall be for you and for the stranger who dwells with you. If we understand that one law is for Jew and Gentile, and we understand that these feasts and these observances point to the plan of salvation so beautifully, so much more than Christmas and Easter, which have their roots in idol worship rather than the scriptures, then why would we want to ignore these things and cleave to things that are not from the scriptures? Why would we not want to keep these things so that we might indeed provoke Israel to jealousy, which was the whole reason why? Yahweh brought salvation to the Gentiles, that he might provoke them to jealousy. For you are all the children of Yahweh by faith in Messiah Yahshua. Galatians 3, 26-29, For as many of you as have been baptized into Messiah have put on Messiah. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in the Messiah, Yahushua. And that's beautiful. Now think back. Let's suppose that it really was true. That the law was only for Jews and not for Gentiles. If that was really true, think about this for a moment. Let's suppose that you have a great-great-great-great-great-grandfather who is Jewish that you didn't know about. And you stand before the Heavenly Father on the Day of Judgment 
And he says, well, didn't you know that your great, 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 great grandfather was Jewish? Why aren't you keeping my law? Is that how he's going to judge us? See, if we go by whether we are of Jewish heritage, what if there's just one Jewish man in our lineage we don't know about? Are we supposed to be focusing then on our genealogy? and Or is it, are we just supposed to be focusing on the fact it's no longer we who live, it's the Jewish Messiah that lives in us? I think we need to realize... Galatians 3.29, that if we are the Messiahs, then we are Abraham's seed. And heirs according to the promise, we're not Gentiles any longer. We are now Abraham's seed. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11, it says, Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles, that is, at one time you were Gentiles, you're not anymore, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, at that time you were without the Messiah, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without Yahweh in the world. But now, in Messiah Yahushua, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of of Messiah. See, you were once Gentiles. And you were once an alien from the commonwealth of Israel. You were once a stranger from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without Yahweh. But then Messiah. Ephesians two fourteen through 16 For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation. No longer are we separated. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to Yahweh in one body through the cross or tree, thereby putting to death the enmity. Now, some believe this means that Yahweh took the law away in order for us to be reconciled with Israel. But no, it doesn't say that. It says he abolished in his flesh the enmity. Now, the law of Yahweh does not bring enmity. Now, the Greek word translated enmity here we're going to bring up the lexicon number 2190. This is Thayer's lexicon. And it says, A hater, passively hated, odious, hateful. And it goes on to say, Hostile, hating and opposing one another. Now, does the law of Yahweh create hatred? Does it create hostility to where people are hating and opposing each other? And so Yahweh had to take away the law in order to make people love each other? Absolutely not. When Yahshua was asked, Teacher, what is the great commandment in the law? Yahshua said to him, You shall love Yahweh your mighty one with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And so every commandment that is given in the law has these two commandments in mind, because on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Every word spoken in the law and the prophets in the Old Testament have two things in mind. Love Yahweh, and love one another. And so the law does not bring hate. The law brings love. Now, Yahshua spoke to the multitudes in Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 through 4, and to his disciples. He said, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, 
and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. And he told them another time in Mark chapter 7, verse 9, he said, All too well you reject the commandment of Yahweh, that you may keep your tradition. You see, the scribes and Pharisees were not commandment keepers, according to Yahshua. They rejected the commandment of Yahweh so that they could keep their traditions. A lot of people think that, well, these are the perfect people that kept the law perfectly. No, they didn't. They were terrible at law keeping, but they were really good at keeping their ordinances of men. And this is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. And the Greek word translated ordinances is dogma, which means a decree by men. And so that is what was taken away. And there were numerous things that the scribes and Pharisees had set up at that time to separate the Jews from the Gentiles. And that's what was broken down. That was the wall of separation that was broken down. The law itself never broke, never created a wall between Jew and Gentile. He said, one law shall be for you and a stranger. And he invited the Gentiles to come in and keep the Sabbath day. We read that earlier. But there were commandments of men that had been set up to keep the Jews and Gentiles separated and being aliens. Yahshua came and broke down all those ordinances of men which were sinful, took them out of the way. Yahweh had said all along in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 32, Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add to it, nor take away from it. And so, let's look at this again. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 17 through 21. And he came and preached peace to you, who were afar off, and to those who were near. For through him, through the that's Messiah, we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. See, Paul is a Jew. He says we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Therefore, now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of Yahweh in whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in Yahweh, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of Yahweh in the Spirit. And so we are no longer strangers, we're no longer Gentiles, we're no longer foreigners. We once were, but we're no longer strangers and aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. We are brought near it is no longer we who live, it's Messiah who lives in us. And so, therefore, we are Israel, and we are Abraham's seed. And there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same master over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of Yahweh shall be saved. Romans 10, verse 12 through 13. And so there's his name again. So why don't we do what he says and call on the name of Yahweh? For from the rising of the sun even to its going down, Yahweh says, My name shall be great among the Gentiles. Why don't we make it so in our hearts and in our lives? Let's magnify Yahweh together and exalt his name together. Psalm 34, verse 3, and Malachi 1, 11. In Romans chapter 11, verse 16, or verses 11 through 16, continuing back in Romans 11, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. See, he wanted to provoke his fellow countrymen to jealousy. For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, see, because they were 
rejecting the Messiah, the whole world was reconciled. What will their acceptance be when Yahweh receives them again, but life from the dead? For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, so Gentiles are grafted in, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. The Hebrew roots. Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if Yahweh did not spare the natural branches, Israel, he may not spare you either. Therefore consider the goodness and severity of Yahweh on those who fell, severity, but toward you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness, his righteousness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for Yahweh is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness, in part, has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And I think we're here. The scripture that says that Jerusalem shall be trodden down by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Jerusalem was retaken by the people of Israel in 1967. And there's been a curious thing that's happened in Christianity since about that time. And that is people are starting to understand and seek out their Jewish roots, the Hebrew roots of their faith. And they're beginning to practice these things that Yahweh has commanded. And as a result, many Jews are coming to the, to the Messiah. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The Deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away unrighteousness from Jacob. And so, it's all predicted. And it's also predicted that the Jews, one day, will receive the Messiah again. He said, Yahshua said in Matthew 23, verse 37 through 39, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more, till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh. You see, it was all predicted. Jerusalem would fall. Your house will be left to you desolate. This is the last time he entered Jerusalem, Matthew 23. And he said, You will see me no more until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh. Who is he that comes in the name of Yahweh? Yahshua the Messiah is the one who comes in the name of Yahweh. And until the people in Jerusalem, the people in Jerusalem, say about the Savior that we know and love, Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh. The Messiah will not return. Yahshua himself said it. He will not return. They will see him no more until they say, 
those words. And so what do we need to do? We need to return to the Hebrew roots from which Christianity came. We need to take our eyes off of modern preachers and teachers, old-time Christianity teachers and preachers, and church father teachers and preachers. And let's let our eyes focus on the Holy Scriptures and what the first century assembly was really like. You know what it was really like? Jews and Gentiles as one body. We also need to realize that sin is really transgression of the law, as 1 John 3, 4 has said, and that we need to turn away from all sin. That means we need to turn away from transgressing Yahweh's law. That means that we will not be of the understanding that we don't have to keep His law anymore, but we will be subject to the law of Yahweh. That's the spiritual mind, because the law is spiritual. The problem is, we were carnal. And we need to end this us and them mentality. We're Gentiles, they're Jews. Because we are all one in the Messiah, Yahshua. Galatians 3.28 We are no longer strangers and foreigners in Ephesians 2. And we are the seed of Abraham through the Messiah. Hallelujah. And we also, I think you'll find that when you begin to practice the things that Yahweh has commanded, you will begin to enjoy the blessings of living by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Yahweh. Now I'm sure by now that some of you watching this video may have never heard of anything quite like this before. And maybe you are wondering, what does this actually look like in a practical sense? Allow me to share with you the blessings of practicing the things that I've mentioned in this video up till now. Take, for instance, the Sabbath day. It is often stated that as we keep the Sabbath, the Sabbath will keep us. What this means is that when we choose to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy as it says in the Ten Commandments, we begin to receive the benefits that Yahweh wanted to bless us with. How many people do we see out there today who are killing themselves, working seven days a week, and not taking the time to have a day of rest? Yahweh, who made our bodies, established a Sabbath on the seventh day of creation, and it was so important that He kept it Himself as an example for us. He knew that our bodies needed rest, and burning the candle at both ends would not be good for us. So as we keep the Sabbath, the Sabbath keeps us. This is also true in a spiritual sense. How many times do we see that people have great difficulty being consistent in their spiritual life? It's like there's something missing. Well, I'm here to tell you that a big part of what is missing is truly keeping the Sabbath day holy. When we do this, the way that He taught us. We will dedicate one full day a week toward getting fed spiritually, getting our minds and our hearts and our thoughts on the things that are pure and lovely and holy. When we do this, we are better able to withstand the darts of the enemy on the other six days. There have been times when I found myself getting spiritually weak through the work week. But then, at the end of the week, like a table in the wilderness, a Sabbath day was waiting for me like an old friend, allowing me to rest and to draw closer to my Creator once again. And so as I have kept the Sabbath, Yahweh has used the Sabbath to keep me. One of the things that we like to do as a family on the Sabbath evening is to prepare a special table with a fancy tablecloth, the best dishes, cloth napkins. We invite others to join with us as we light candles or an oil lamp just before sundown. And we sit down with others or just our family and have a special Sabbath meal together as a family. We even leave an empty seat at the head of the table for Yahshua and invite him to join us 
as we dedicate this day to the Master of the Sabbath. Then I'll get out the guitar and we'll sing some spiritual songs together. Our children like to play instruments and they join me. And then afterward, I'll lay my hands on my children and my wife and speak over them a special blessing. The little children especially get pretty excited, visibly excited, when the Sabbath is approaching. And it's really a day for families to draw closer to each other, for Yahweh's people to gather together if they are able, and for all of us to draw closer to our Creator, enjoying the day that our Savior said was made for man. And I think that you'll find there's something very special about it, and it will put a smile on your face. Also, the feast days are a blessing as well. Many churches sensed that there was something missing somewhere. And to this day, we have an observance called Thanksgiving that was established by the pilgrims as they came over to America. Then there's vacation Bible schools, gatherings for various spiritual retreats and conferences. But did you know that right out of the pages of Scripture, Yahweh has established something for us to express our thanksgiving to our Heavenly Father. It's called the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles is a time when we have a festival to honor Him for the abundance of all things, for us to hear His word and rejoice before Him. There is no other holiday that could ever be invented by man to compare to the blessing of this feast. We really get together and have a great time, having our spiritual batteries recharged, and we develop deep, meaningful, personal relationships with each other. The body of Messiah becomes more connected and more able to function like it's supposed to as we get to know each other. So I guess what I'm trying to share is that there is a great blessing awaiting those who are willing to embrace the Hebraic roots. And it is a far cry from this law of being a burden mentality that we often see. When we really love someone, we delight to do things for them. And so when we gather together for our Heavenly Father to glorify Him, it's out of love for Him. Yahweh says in the Scriptures, If you call the Sabbath a delight, and call the holy day of Yahweh honorable, then you will delight yourself in Yahweh, and He will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, that's eternal life. And the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. We can believe it. The mouth of Yahweh has spoken. He will bless us. Every autumn in September or October, we hold a gathering. The Feast of Tabernacles in Eminence, Missouri. There, we have an entire campground to ourselves. And it is a very wonderful time of fellowship and drawing near to Yahweh together, learning from each other, baptizing, finding new people to fellowship with, learning each other's prayer needs, with new relationships being formed, so we may bear one another's burdens more effectively. And so if keeping these appointed times sound like a blessing to you, keep an eye on Eliad.com for the next feast gathering. Meanwhile, I am sure you probably have a lot of questions by now. Now, there are a lot of studies on this website that will address many of your questions in detail. For instance, there's a verse-by-verse -verse study on the book of Galatians. We also hold a live video broadcast every Sabbath at 12 noon Eastern Time. During this broadcast, we will discuss a variety of biblical topics, and you can call in with your questions and comments. There is also music and special things for children as well during the broadcast. Meanwhile... I hope that you've enjoyed this presentation on the Hebrew roots of Christianity. We do travel, so if you would be interested in having us visit your church or congregation, we would love to come and see you. I'm willing to share on the Hebrew roots or most any other topic presented on this website. My name is Tom Martinsik, known online under the name Elia, and you can simply contact me by clicking the contact form on the left side of the main page of this site. Or you can simply go to elia.com forward slash contact 
www.hbrook.html. Thank you for watching this presentation on the Hebrew roots. May Yahweh bless you, and may He have mercy on us all as we seek to walk as our Savior walked. Amen and hallelujah.